This is a flashback. Like in the movies where everything is unclear and out of focus. There's this haze of nostalgia, like you swiped left on a filter on your phone and there's an artistic yet intentional blur. My mother is cooking food. The smell of fresh fried noodles permeates the air. The intense sound of oil sizzling surrounds us and it seems to grow louder. The scent becomes stronger. She handles the pan like a pro. And with her free hand, she half dances the lambon, a traditional Lao dance. Of course, I'm not paying attention. I'm playing video games. I've got to get the plumber in overalls to save a princess from a lizard. Why? I don't know, but I'm invested. But my mom makes me stop so I can eat dinner and I'm annoyed. I just want to play my video games. I think back then when there were princesses to save and toys to play with, enjoying a meal was really a waste of time. But my mother's noodles were my favorite. Qua me. With little chunks of chicken, morsels of fried eggs dispersed throughout, a bit of cilantro gave an explosion of freshness every now and then. But I made the mistake of bringing this little bit of magic to school one day. Ew, he's eating worms. What's that weird food? It smells. My favorite dish was now an embarrassment. Why would my parents do this to me? Why couldn't they have just bought me a box lunch or packed me a sandwich? How dare they spend time and energy making my favorite food for me? Didn't they realize no one else would have this kind of food? I just wanted to be like everyone else. I just wanted to fit in. I mean, I hadn't learned how to cook yet. I didn't appreciate the love and labor poured into this meal. There's so many things I missed as a child. Ever since I started school, I wouldn't eat Lao food. My parents would have to force me to eat their home cooked meals. They ended up just going to a fast food place and getting me a burger meal because they know that's what I eat. So really my addiction to fast food is their fault, not mine. Speaking of food, have you ever been called a banana or Twinkie? I have. The nickname my siblings gave me. Yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Do you want to know a secret? I'm Asian. American. But Asian American with a hyphen. Well, Laotian to be exact. Laotian American with a hyphen. Does anyone else find it weird that other countries don't do the hyphenated thing? Just the United States. I'm actually not sure what I am. This hyphenated identity with no idea what this term American even means. I was born here in America, so that makes me an American, technically. And to some people, that's only a technicality. But judging from the way I look, I do not belong here. Go back to where you came from. And that's the thing. When people ask me where I'm from, I can't answer automatically. I have to think about what they mean because of the way I look. Do they mean Laos? Even though I've never been there, I know nothing about the place. Actually, I'm from Arkansas, but I don't think that's what they mean when they say, go back to where you came from. Fort Smith, Arkansas, to be exact went to Spradling Elementary School. Back when patriotism was ingrained in our learning, we said the Pledge of Allegiance every day to the American flag. In fifth grade, my favorite song was God Bless the USA. Cause I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and I gladly stand up Right there, that pause, that was my favorite part. It was so dramatic. I remember always singing along. I remember I always stood up. I remember when I was proud to be an American. And that was elementary school. When I was surrounded by my peers, loving and supportive. But then my parents decided to move to a farm out in the country. 
New Town, Huntington, Arkansas, population 723. New school, Mansfield High School. New experience, blatant racism. I had few friends. There were only two other Asian people in our school district and they weren't even in my grade. They went to the elementary school, but our parents would hang out. We'd always play video games together when our parents were partying, which was a lot. We stuck together because you know, school is tough enough as it is. And this was when I became super religious. See, growing up, my mother was Buddhist and my father was Catholic. So my sister and I would go to church while my brother went to temple. But when we moved to the farm, I hadn't gone to church in years. And I remember one time in history class, our teacher, who was also the football coach, asked us to raise our hand if we were baptized Christian. And I was the only one who didn't raise their hand. Apparently, I was baptized Catholic as a baby, but I don't remember that. But I could feel their eyes piercing me. Maybe I should have just raised my hand to fit in. Later that day, these two girls came up to me and invited me to church with them. The church was nice enough. They talked about the band and an upcoming water park trip. And then there came this moment where everyone closed their eyes. And if anyone wanted to be saved, now was the time. I'm pretty sure I was the only one who wasn't saved. Even with our eyes closed, I could feel them staring at me. So I did it. I asked God to save my soul so that I could be a better person, so that I could fit in. A secret my parents still don't know about. This is a vital part of one's life. People are so easily persuaded in school. I was already dealing with the fact that I found other men attractive. I was already so different on the outside I just wanted to be normal on the inside. And I had no one to turn to without being shunned, so I thought I could ask God for help. Dear God, I don't know how to do this. I've already asked you to save my soul, so I feel like that's already a lot to ask, but I do have one more thing. Could you please make me normal? Start with my nose. My mom has always pinched my nose growing up, saying, I hope you don't get to see her off nose. It's so flat and ugly. And the popular girls at school always push their nose in and squint their eyes and say, ching chong, ching chong. And the football players already call me fag. If they found out that I'm gay, my life would be over. So, please just, change me. I hate my life. Please just give me a new one. Make me straight. Make me white. Make me normal. Please. God didn't answer. I went days continuing to ask God to change me. Is this what it means to be American? To make people assimilate or emotionally assault the people that are different. After graduating high school, I went to college and changed my major several times before I finally settled on theater. I was in drama club as an extracurricular since I sucked at sports, but we ended up doing this Cirque du Soleil style device show. The theme was fear in society after a catastrophe, like think 9-11. And after a show, an audience member came up to me and she took my hand and she said, I will never look at life the same way. Thank you. And at that moment, I decided that making a difference in someone's life using art was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that's what brought me to Portland. After conservatory school and working a bit, I met an amazing support system of artists, and eventually helped start a local Asian American theater company, which brought my focus back towards myself. I was learning about kabuki and no theater, Japanese and Chinese culture and history, 
but still had no knowledge of my parents' homeland. So in 2017, I decided to study traditional music, dance, and theater in Laos. When I boarded my connecting flight in Korea, I was greeted by a flight attendant who looked like me. And they were so friendly. Sabaidi, welcome to your flight. That familiar greeting filled me with calmness and excitement. Without knowing it, a smile had formed on my face. I buckled myself in and got ready for an adventure. When the plane landed, I looked out of the window. It was the end of December, but the sun was out and there were these lush palm trees and all the plants were so green. It felt like I was returning home, even though I'd never been there before. And when I stepped off the plane, my feet touched my homeland for the first time. I will never forget that moment. I could feel my heart beating in my chest. It felt like my blood was tickling my veins as it ran through them. I was giddy. Sometimes you forget how new the United States is. There are so many temples with elephants and gold everywhere. When you go abroad to a place that's had centuries of culture, you can just feel the history. Being in Laos really connected some dots for me. The things about my family that I never understood all made sense now. Like how my grandfather would always just walk around the neighborhood and check in on us and go into our backyard gardens and help with the plants or just talk to us. That's what people do in Laos. They make these human connections and it was so easy to just be humans with each other. I didn't need to be on my phone to not feel lonely. I took music lessons on the Hmong three-stringed instrument and the kid, which is a bamboo harmonica very popular in Laos and Thailand. I studied dance for a week with a nationally renowned instructor and performer at the National School of Performing Arts. He ended up making me two masks while he was teaching me for the week. I booked this beautiful Airbnb with this man named Mike and his wife, Sukia. They had a pool and this cute pond with a lush garden. His house was located in the capital, Vientiane, but he offered to drive me and keep me company during my stay with him. Mike ended up taking me to the COPE Center, which he helped start. The COPE Center is a nonprofit that helps ensure that people with physical disabilities have local affordable access to rehabilitation services. About one third of those receiving a prosthetic device with COPE are UXO survivors. That's when he explained the history of Laos that I had never known. There are no American combat forces in Laos. We have been uh, providing logistical support and some training for the neutralist government in order to avoid uh, Laos falling under communist domination. As far as American manpower in Laos is concerned, there are none there at the present time on a combat basis. Uh, we do have aerial reconnaissance. Uh, we do have perhaps some other activities. I won't discuss those other activities at this time. What Nixon failed to say was from 1964 to 1973, the United States administered 580,344 bombing missions in Laos. Over 2 million tons of bombs were dropped on Laos, making it the most bombed country per capita in history. That's more bombs than the US dropped in Germany and Japan combined during World War II. That's comparable to a plane load of bombs every eight minutes 24 hours a day for nine years, all in secret. And not very many Americans know about it today. Mike told me about a 16-year-old kid he had worked with. He was a mischievous kid. He would always play tricks and make jokes all the time. I imagined him like Hanuman from the Prolog Prolong, the national epic of Laos, always exploring, curious, and tricking people, but brave. 
This boy was playing with a ball his friend had found. This metal ball turned out to be an unexploded bomblet, or bomby as people call them. One of the UXO I talked about earlier, it had been dormant until it exploded in his hands. He was blinded by the shrapnel and lost both of his hands. How could he ever dance the Lumbong now? Over 30% of the bombs that were dropped in Laos did not explode. 80 million of the bombs dropped failed to detonate, leaving a deadly legacy that plagues the Laotian population today, covering a third of the nation. 50,000 Laotians were killed during the nine years of the bombings, but since 1973, over 20,000 Laotians have been killed by these unexploded bombs. Farmers digging in the soil, civilians cooking too close to a bomblet, and children playing with an unassuming object. That boy's simple encounter with one of those cluster bombs turned his life upside down. He spent the first two years after the accident isolated, mostly alone in his room at home. He had to teach himself how to do the most basic task without sight or use of his hands, from opening doors to washing and feeding himself. After rehabilitation, he began learning new skills and making friends. He also learned English and now has become one of the better known advocates for similar victims in Laos. He's become a peer counselor and get this, he even started his own hip hop dance troupe. Mike showed me the makeshift stage he had in the shed. Ever since I learned about this secret war, I don't know what to think. This country that I've recently discovered and come to love is still hurting from a great injury from before I was even born. I felt guilty. Guilt as an American? The country I call home has done this horrific thing and doesn't even have the decency to learn from its mistakes. I had guilt of ignorance. I continued talking to Mike about this, and he had been in contact with several people who were also interested in this bit of history. He showed me this book called Voices from the Plain of Jars by Fred Brantman. It was a collection of poetry and drawings of survivors that were interviewed after the bombings. The drawings were so vivid. Jets dropping bombs, fire falling from the sky, and even one with body parts flying off of bodies. I can't imagine witnessing such a horrible thing. I cried reading it. Their voices were so simple and innocent. Why did the planes drop bombs on us? I think back and within me tears want to fall, but they are not enough. All children born into this world have hardship, but not like this. Mike told me these drawings and accounts fell into the hands of Chanapa Kamvongsa, who created Legacies of War, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing attention to unexploded ordnance awareness, education, and removal in Laos. She had spoken in front of the House of Representatives and later got the attention of President Obama in 2016. He became the first president to visit the country and meet the people of Laos. Whatever the cause, whatever our intentions, war inflicts a terrible toll, especially on innocent men, women, children. Today I stand with you in acknowledging the suffering and sacrifices on all sides of that conflict. And from the anguish of war, there came an unlikely bond between our two peoples. Today, the United States is home to many proud Laotian Americans. Many have made a hard journey through refugee camps and relocation, building new lives in a new country. And even as they've become Americans, they've held on to their Lao heritage, worshiping in their temples, honoring their elders, dancing the Lam Yong. Even now, they remember a beloved song that if we depart from our homeland and flee far away from her, we will always have you as our true friend as long as we live. And as a new generation has come of age, more Laotian Americans have made the journey here to their ancestral homeland. Said one of them, who was born in Vyangchon, our heart and home have always been in Laos. This secret war is part of my legacy. It's an American legacy. And good or bad, this is part of our history. And I think it's important to find our history and ask questions. Although finding out about these events felt crippling, 
I decided to create this project to help me unpack and really deal with this information in a positive and open way. I'm sure the title of this makes you want to sing Secret Asian Man. Well, the secret agents in those movies are always seeking inner peace, not to have to keep all those secrets anymore. So I started this journey where I came from, Arkansas. I went to visit my parents and I remember walking through the front door and the smell of food. My dad had made fresh pho, fresh homemade broth, all the fixings on the side. I dropped my bags in my room and my dad asked me, you kawa, are you hungry? And I said, yes. He came into my room and put down a hamburger meal. My heart broke a little bit. Apparently my Asian identity had been a secret from my parents the entire time. Is this what it means to be American? I worked even more diligently on the script and as I was looking for songs to put in, I found these traditional Lao songs that I remembered the words to automatically. I found the song that opened the show that my mom would always sing to while she was cooking. I asked my mom what it meant. She was surprised I was interested and she had a smirk on her face when she called my dad in to answer. My parents said it means, come on, keep on going. So that's been my mantra since I was little, even though I didn't know what it meant. So I was rediscovering it, kind of like I was rediscovering my identity. So where do I go from here? I don't know, but I'm gonna keep on going. <laughs>